Hi, everyone. I know I'm live, but my little screen was showing the uh, fixed picture earlier. <laughs> uh, Bill Fairman, and I have Jonathan Davis on uh, another screen. Wendy is... I don't think I can hear anything. Um, that, that's okay. We'll get you here in a minute. Um, Carolina Capital Management, Wendy is out of town. And so uh, it's just going to be Jonathan and I today. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Our website is carolinahardmoney.com. And if you have uh, an interest in becoming a borrower, just click on the borrower tab. If you're interested in passive returns, uh, click on the uh, investor tab. Uh, Also, we have a little chat bar to the, uh, well, at least it's to the right for me. I don't know where it is on your screen. But you can join into the conversation. Uh, this is our ugly question segment. But I did want to, you know, kind of follow up or, or add on to this. I've gotten some uh, really good data here that I wanted to share with folks. Before I get started with that, I got to show you something that's uh, a little new to us. Our streaming platform here added uh, the availability of extra screens. So uh, Scott here and his brilliant ingenuity said, hey, hook up some other cameras in the form of iPhone. So uh, Scott, if you'll do me a favor and switch to camera number one, please. So you are literally getting the behind the scenes look at uh, Studio One, (laughs) as it were. So you get to see what I'm looking at. As you can see, I have a webcam right in front of my face. And I've got this professional um, overnight envelope with notes uh, taped to it. Uh, We've got the big screen that, you know, I have, I can see my guests on and I talk to folks. Uh, Lights, because I'm old and I have bags under my eyes and this kind of helps eliminate some of that along with these glasses. And then uh, we have the camera two over here. So that gives you a little closer look with whether you want it or not. (laughs) So if you want to set up your own studio, by the way, I suggest, as you can see right here in front of me, is our microphone. And the microphone that I use is one that has a directional, uh, I forget what the heck you call it, but it's only one direction. So you don't get a 360 degree pickup from around the room and it eliminates a lot of the additional noise that you might pick up. Also do not let it sit on your desk or your table because as soon as you touch that table or, you know, hit your mouse or whatever, you're going to hear it through the microphone. So get a microphone stand if you're going to do that. Okay. Uh, Some of the data, we uh, did a panel discussion with uh, five other fund managers yesterday, and there were some interesting statistics I wanted to share with folks. And it's uh, basically how uh, things are going right now in the single family arena. And Jonathan, I know you can pipe in. Um, Can you hear? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, great. Um, You can pipe in on this as well. The vast majority of the people, and this is in the note space and in the commercial space and in the uh, single family lenders and people that are buying, their consensus is the same. Single family right now is booming that as long as you're in that affordable market, wherever it is that your market is, um, prices are going up and they continue to go up. You You find that true as well? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we're we're seeing that across, and and prices go up, like you said, in in that affordable um, range, which you know every every place is a little different, but yeah, in that affordable area, I'm seeing you know compression on the high stuff, and then we're seeing expansion on the affordable housing. Right, and mm-hmm. that's not to say that there uh, is not going to be an issue in the housing market in twelve to eighteen months. Okay, uh, but. For right now, prices are about as high as they're going to get for a while. So my suggestion to you is if you have a single family property that 
maybe not be, it's not performing like it, you'd like it to, or it's a pain in the rear end. Now might be a good time to cash out and then use that money in some other arena. Uh, obviously you have tax consequences, so you have to look at that as well. Uh, but now may be time to take some money off the table and move a property to prepare for when I'm not saying prices will drop in 10 or you know 12 to 18 months, but they're certainly not going to uh, go up like they were before you know, because you're going to have a lot of extra supply on the market when uh, foreclosures start happening and uh, you're, you're going to have a lot of people that are going to be able to rent as well back into apartments because they're going to start having deals on the apartment because as soon as they start lifting those moratoriums on evictions and foreclosures, uh, th there's going to be an uptick. Don't you agree? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, that, that's what they're going to have to, they're going to have to get bodies in there and increase the occupancy. And then from that point on, they'll have to start like, slowly raising the rents right. to get the, get the NOI where they need it to go. But yeah, the step one is get bodies in the door. And if you look at the, uh, there's some statistics on the, the four major banks in the, you know, just before COVID hit their loan loss reserves were, and I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but uh, they were pretty low. And in, you know, June and July, their loan loss reserves have uh, 10X'd what they were prior to that. Yep. So the big banks are expecting some losses <laughs> in the housing market. And now, they're, they're not going to sell a note, let's say, uh, and, or even look at charging a note off until it's more than 90 days delinquent. If yeah, and, that's, and that's pretty soon, too, for, for a bank. Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, if they have um, an issue with not being able to foreclose because there's a moratorium on it or, you know, it depends on the state. The federal government only has a moratorium on the federally backed loans. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I don't know if that's going to include Fannie and Freddie because it's supposed to be a quasi government agency, but they basically own it. <laughs> uh, so that being said, as long as they have a moratorium, it's just holding off the inevitable for, for some folks. Uh, is there an opportunity to get in there and, and buy some uh, notes that are going to be distressed and, be able to work them out. Absolutely. Because one of the great things that we have now that we didn't have in 08 is that we have tons of equity in our house. The average uh, loan being made currently is at 82% loan to value. And that's Fannie Freddie uh, stuff. So if you've had your home for several years, uh, you know, you continue to build up equity because the prices is going are, are going up. Now, obviously if there's a slowdown and there's an oversupply, then, you know, those prices will either come down slightly or at least be flat. You're not going to have as much equity, but we're, we are equity heavy right now. So there's a good chance that you'll be able to uh, modify a bunch of these notes if you end up buying some distressed. Mm -hmm. And then at, at the same time, I, I, there's going to be foreclosures available to uh, for investors. Uh, interesting thing here is I read today in the Mecklenburg Times, if you're not in our area, the Mecklenburg Times is a publication that's really for Charlotte and surrounding areas. Uh, it's about real estate, but it also has the uh, foreclosures, liens, all that kind of stuff in there. It, it's a paper that comes out twice a week and it's, it's really for investors. Um, the interesting story and a side note here. This is the front page that the story is on. Okay. At the bottom, it says C generations on page six and you go to page six and there's nothing that says generations. <laughs> it's a whole nother page of stuff. The actual continuance is on page seven and it's under a completely different name. <laughs> you come out twice a week 
I love this paper, but do some editing. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> the premise here <laughs> is that millennials, and they call it the silent generation. These are people between 74 and 94, uh, have the same interest in housing and why they are moving. And why this is interesting is Typically, when you're between 74 and 94, you're downsizing. And millennials are typically buying affordable housing. So do you think there's a bit of a competition there for the same houses in these areas? The, the biggest factor for people to buy a home, both millennials and the silent generation, is to move closer to family and friends. It hmm. used to be that the biggest reason was because of jobs. You were moving to a particular job or to go to a better job. That's why you were moving. Is, or, is that a, is that a recent statistic because of COVID or is that a longstanding fact of millennials? Well, I don't, it's hard to say because the uh, study was done in 2020. So it's just a recent study. So I don't know how far back that goes. Well, my, 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 I guess my point would be, you know, with, with, people being able to work remotely from anywhere like, yeah, then I see the draw of going, you know, moving close to your family yep. um, as opposed to if you, you know, have to go find the job and work yep. near the job. No, that, that makes great sense. Yeah. Um, my, what, what I gleaned from this is that all these people are going to be competing for the same property, which is more affordable housing because most millennials have not gotten into that, situation where they're going to be buying, you know, a luxury house. They're going to still be in the, you know, middle income type houses. And then the uh, 74 to 94, you know, they have plenty of equity, but they don't want to use it on another big house. They want a smaller home and then they want to use that rest of that money as, you know, retirement income. So they're all competing for the same home. So that said, because we, it's, there's not enough margin in building affordable homes for, um, you know, big builders, people that are doing track homes. They, they can't make enough money on those. So they're not doing very many of them until they come up with a way to make those homes uh, more profitable for the builders. They're going to rely on the one-off people, the people that are doing, you know, a few homes a year, uh, new construction. And then the, yep. uh, uh, the fix and flip people, uh, because, you know, there's the land costs are so high. Now I, I say that, and I'm going to back up a little bit when, if we do have a downturn, land prices will start going down. That's the first thing that'll go down. Yeah. Because yeah. those are the least liquid out of all the real estate. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that being the case, um, that may change a little bit and make the affordable housing more affordable. Uh, I also uh, got news that D.R. Horton, big national builder, is teaming up with Zillow, um, who was back in all 50 states with their iBuyer uh, type stuff, where it's called Zillow Offers, where they cut the realtors out altogether. And, you know, they, they, they do the, so they're competing with the investors that are trying to do wholesale or competing with the investors that are just trying to buy out uh, uh, properties at a discount. And then they're cutting out the realtors because you don't need a realtor if you're selling your house to Zillow so you can buy your DR Horton home. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's something that uh, all, realtors and investors need to keep in mind that, um, you know, the big corporations are now trying to compete in your space. And if you're a realtor and you're paying anything to Zillow to advertise on, you should stop, stop it. <laughs> yeah, You should stop. I mean, you are paying for your own demise because they're not working to help you. They're working against you. <laughs> All right. You want to, you want to tackle a question here, Bill? Yeah, I get, I'll get off my soapbox, I guess. <laughs> Okay. Remember, you can ask a question as well. Just you know, put it in the little chat box over here. Um, all right. So here's our first question. Why do I have to pay interest 
on rehab money I have not yet used. And that, <laughs> that, listen, that's an awesome question. Yeah. And it's a good question. Well, can, can I, can I jump in here real quick? Absolutely. So if you don't pay money on your rehab, that's called uh, non-Dutch interest. If you are paying money on your rehab or interest on your rehab, that's called Dutch interest. So most lenders um, are going to be Dutch interest lenders where uh, if they are making capital available to you um, whenever you need it, uh, assuming you know your inspection comes through uh, or invoices or whatever they're requiring, then you're going to pay interest on that because they're holding that money for you. Um, now, your much bigger lenders are going to be, you know, like maybe large banks, maybe some, you know, giant billion dollar hedge fund, I don't, you know, someone who has more unlimited capital. They're probably going to be your only non-Dutch lenders out there. And that's just because they have so much capital that it, it it's, you know, it's they're able to not collect interest on lazy capital. Yeah, and and that's a good point, and, and that's um, where I was going to go with this as well. Uh, most private lenders slash hard money lenders are balance sheet lenders, and they have limited capital. Now, an individual that's loaning you money, they have uh, more limitations on their capital than someone like us who has a fund. But even though we have a fund, we still have a limited amount of capital. Uh, We're not a big hedge fund. We're not a bank. The other thing is that uh, banks and your giant uh, institutional funds that are attached to Wall Street are much more liquid. They have a lot more money coming in and out. And they can afford to not set aside money um, Mm -hmm. for your project because they know it's liquid. Stuff is always coming in and going out. Um, your balance, your smaller balance sheet lenders like us, uh, if here's the thing, if I take capital that I have to earmark for you and it's not earning anything that hurts our returns for our investors. Yeah. If I say, okay, well, I'm not going to earn any money on it. So I'm going to lend it out. And hopefully when it's time for you to, you know, get more rehab money, I'll have more money back by then. And you don't want to go through that either. (laughs) (laughs) No, no, you don't want to go through that. It's So to guarantee that your money is there, the full amount you need to finish your job, your your project, is that you're going to have to pay interest on it. Now, you can get to the point where you can get lines of credit, uh, you know, through banks or uh, other institutions, and you don't have to worry about that. You use the, the capital in your line of credit to acquire the property, and then you dip into it as you go mm-hmm. um, when you're doing your uh, your funds. But you have to get to a certain point for that. And as uh, credit tightens up because of you know COVID and the economy, uh, you know, kind of slowing down, ba- banks are going to tighten up on those those lines of credit. That's uh, land and lines of credit. Those are the Two things they tighten up on most often in, in yeah. a downturn. Don't you agree? Yeah, yeah. And I just want to say on the on the on the question on the on paying interest on the rehab, we know it can be you know it's a pain point for for any borrower to be paying you know money that or, or interest on money that you don't tangibly have in your hand. Um, so we make a very concerted effort to make sure that your draws go through as quickly and as seamlessly as possible. Most of our draws, you know, from submission to us putting the money in the account is probably two to four days is pretty typical. And we do that, you know, purposefully because, you know, you're paying interest on it. We want to get it to you as quick as possible, assuming all the work was done. Sure. Um, I was going to get back to that. I mean, there are some lenders out there, like I said, that that do – allow you to not be charged any interest on that money, but, uh, they're, uh, they're, they're going to, well, they're very large and they're not going to be as easy to work with as we are. <laughs> so you, yeah. You gotta pick your poison, um, a little bit less, or is it going to be hard? Or are they going to be harder to work with? Um, so th- those are the things you have to keep in mind. And, that's, uh, and, and, and also, you know, if you're not paying money on that interest, you know, how long does it take for you to get that? 
So, you know, what's the back end administrative work, the red tape that they have to go through to clear those funds for you so that you can get it to your project? Uh, it's usually going to take a little more time. And as we all know, in you know, fix and flips, new construction, whatever it is, time is money. So the sooner you can get your money, even if you have to pay a little bit more for it, is better because right. it gets you to the, the end project that much sooner, which, you know, makes you more money in the end. It, it does add an additional layer of accounting yeah. to each loan when you're doing that as well. Um, I, and I, I'm going to end that question with uh, one last comment. You don't know how many times I've heard where somebody was borrowing money from a, a an individual person and they couldn't finish their uh, projects because they didn't have the rehab money uh, when they needed it because they said, okay, we'll go ahead and fund your acquisition. And by the time you're ready to use this amount of money, this other loan will have paid off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And for some reason they didn't get paid off yet. So um, I'm not sure I've ever had a loan pay off or I guess a, a, a borrower pay off a property with a sale that was on time. Like yeah. never is. Well, s sometimes they pay off early unexpectedly. Yeah, they, that, yeah. But they never pay off on time, expectedly. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. Um, here's another one. Is my investment guaranteed by Carolina Capital? Well, it would depend, right, on what it is. But the short answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> there are no guarantees in life. And well, taxes and death, right? Yeah. Those are the two. I, I will explain <laughs> uh, some fun structure and Jonathan, you can jump in here anytime, but uh, a lot of fund structures will have two parts to a fund. One will be a debt component and one will be an equity component. Now our documents say that we have a debt and equity component. We never exercise the debt uh, component because uh, when you're using the debt component, let me kind of explain what that is. You're loaning the fund money, just like you would be uh, putting your money in a CD. You get a guaranteed interest rate for, you know, one to three years, however long you do it for, you know, doing it for one year, you're going to get a much lower rate than you would if you're doing it for three years. Mm -hmm. um, that said, at the end of that term, you can either renew or you can get your money back. And the reason we chose not to do that, even though it's in our documents is twofold. Number one, we weren't paying enough interest and no one was interested in doing it. <laughs> Everybody we knew when we started our fund were active investors and they could get a lot, a lot more return just, you know, doing individual loans. They, they wanted the return they were getting if they were making the loans themselves to the borrower. So uh, that wasn't going to be possible in a guaranteed return, um, you know, borrowing money or the fund borrowing money. So we never chose that option. Everybody is an equity partner, which means you're only getting paid based on the profit of the fund that quarter. That, that's that, your guarantee is that you're getting you're guaranteed to get whatever the fund uh, made in profit that quarter because you own a piece of the fund. You're a business partner that owns a piece of the fund. All these funds are investor owned LLCs. And so your guarantee is you're getting a split of whatever the net profit is, uh, you know, for each quarter or month, depending on how each fund uh, operates. Yeah. Uh, if you're um, a lender, uh, yes, you're, you're getting a, your interest is on the note. You're, you're, then, then a note is assigned to you. You're getting a certain part of it. Well, you're getting the interest rate minus any uh, servicing uh, fees you'd have to pay to us or anybody else that would be servicing your loan. Mm -hmm. But that, that rate is guaranteed. But again, it's, it's only guaranteed if the borrower pays. <laughs> well, yeah. You, just like do, does Carolina capital management guarantee uh, any, you know, any like specific return or any kind of rate? No, no, we don't. Um, if, if you're buying a loan, your guarantee is the borrower. Most of them, if I, I would say 99.9% .9 of them have personal guarantees. 
So the person who owns or the, or the people who own that LLC who's taking the loan are personally guaranteeing the loan. They are. Um, we, we can't do that. Um, and then on the fund side, like, like Bill said, you know, the guarantee is your ownership. You know, you're guaranteed to make whatever the fund makes uh, your pro rata share. Right. Yeah. And uh, again, there's no guarantees. That's why you have a lien on the property. Yep. And, you know, you build in enough of a cushion that if you, if the borrower stops paying, you have to take the property back in the long run. Then there's enough cushion to get your principal back and hopefully make additional money. Yeah. Your, that, your, your guarantee is if you, if you buy a loan from us, that we'll do everything we can to help you along the way. Um, but we, you know, that's, that's the only guarantee we can give you is we'll, we'll, well, we'll we do all the heavy lifting way. for you uh, mm -hmm. when you're, um, if you, if you ever had to foreclose, uh, we recommend you not foreclose. Um, there's other ways of doing it without having to take possession of the property. Uh, we've learned from experience. If you own the property, it's very difficult to have uh, another contractor come in and finish in someone else's work. Yep. Uh, you're, you're better off selling it to the contractor because they don't mind doing their own work. <laughs> well, I mean, think about the, the, the properties that we took back um, and uh, forget 18. who the, yeah, yeah. in 18 and, and we became the, you know, essentially the GC on the, on the project. And we're, in North Carolina, we're liable for a year for fixes after we sell it. And, and I know Wendy had to go do, uh, had someone go do some work on one of the houses because of the contractor made an error, but we were, you know, we have to pay for it. So you don't, right. you don't want to be in that position if you, if you can avoid it. Yeah. But the, the whole, the whole point is that there's a big enough cushion in place, uh, to take care of that. And then, you, you know, uh, we underwrite like a bank anyway, we we're proving that they have the income, that they have the, credit and the, uh, capacity and the willingness to make, uh, make payments. Um, we do background checks to make sure they're, uh, you know, good folks and they have to have experience. And, yep. um, so, you know, you, you do what you can to minimize it. Our, our typical delinquency, uh, since we've been in business has been less than 2%, which is pretty, pretty darn good. And, and you'll find it in most, uh, lenders that do what we do, you're going to find pretty much the same across the board. Now there, there are some people that do not care about anything other than the equity and they will make loans to people who not just don't pay on time, but don't pay at all because they just soon get the property. But uh, do you think they're going to be lending them as much money as we do to get a project done? <laughs> yeah, no, no, they will not. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're probably lending, uh, 50% or less of the value of that property. Uh, we do have uh, a couple of questions. Okay. Um, from the, from the same, same person, PCS girls. Uh, do you accept accredited investors? Yes, we do. So go to the carolinahardmoney.com, click on the investor tab and you'll get more information on that. And then uh, how do you guys make money points? Uh, <laughs> what is that? That's a, well, I see fees. Oh, finder's fee. Uh, and at what rate? So if, if you're asking if we work with brokers, uh, yes, we do. Um, and, uh, you know, brokers get paid. Uh, we, we typically charge three to four points, depending on experience and how long, uh, you know, the customer has been with us, uh, their experience level, the project type. Uh, our rates range from 9.99 to what? 12, 11, yeah, 12. yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Um, uh, and then, uh, yeah, we, we make money on the fees. We make money on the interest. Uh, and when we in, encompasses a lot cause we, you know, we have a fund. So the fund has a good split of a lot of that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. The, the, you know, I guess if, if you specifically like, you know, Bill gets paid by the fund, you know, he, you know, he's the manager of the fund. So, and we have an origination company, we have a management company and we have a fund. Um, our origination company, uh, get, it gets paid all the, the, uh, the fees and stuff like that. And that's for all the overhead for all the personnel that we have, 
all the third party vendors, you know, those sorts of things. Um, it collects those fees, uh, make money might be a stretch, but it collects those fees. Uh, and then, you know, yeah. And then, you know, we, you know, the points are split between the management company and the, and the fund. Right. Mm -hmm. And then if we have a broker that's involved, um, you know, they get, they get points too, uh, but some of it's from us. Some of it's from the, from the borrower. Everything is disclosed. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, so yeah, we, you know, yeah, we, uh, we have three companies that we're trying that, that are involved here and, uh, they all get some piece of it, but the, the fund gets the, the vast majority of everything hmm. and that's to protect, uh, our investors. And uh, here's another question. Um, have you had a time where the fixture couldn't get refinanced? Well, right now, yeah. first and <laughs> foremost, your, your, your first exit strategy is to sell the property. Now, if you're buying the property for the purpose of, uh, buy and hold rentals and you're acquiring it, fixing it up and then getting it refinanced, then that is your exit strategy is getting it refinanced. Uh, yeah, it, it's happened before we've, We've ended up, and, and typically what happens is we come to an arrangement. Um, sometimes they, they'll just do a um, deed in lieu, and we'll, we'll already have buyers that'll you know buy it for that. Um, it's a shame. I, I hate seeing that happen when someone fixes a house and then can't sell it. Uh, we try and do the best we can on the front end to pre prevent that from happening. Uh, but, you know, in the end, we're not the ones that are, you know, working with that. We're, we're not the contractor on it. Um, the fixer, mm -hmm. the flipper is the one that takes all the risk. That's why we're lenders and we're not fixing flippers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and if you, if you're, if you're buying a property to like fix to rent or whatever, and you get a, and you get a renter in there, um, part of your due diligence and your underwriting before you go into buying this property is to make sure that the property either breaks even or cash flows at the rate that you're taking this loan. Um, because yeah, we don't know the future and, and maybe you might be, you know, it's great that there's a, a, a tenant in there, but you want to make sure that that tenant, that, 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 in, that uh, payment is covering your interest and hopefully your taxes and your insurance. Mm -hmm. So that needs to be part of your due diligence when you're looking at the property is making sure like, Hey, if I can't refinance this, how long can I stay afloat? How long can this property take care of itself? Yeah. And that being said, you know, markets change. You, you may qualify for a refinance today mm -hmm. and you know, six months from now when your house is finished, things change. You don't, do you think things change much from January to March <laughs> <laughs> and everything was good to go in January, but I just needed a couple little things before I could get refinanced to this, uh, uh, you know, long-term rental loan. And then all of a sudden March came and they were all gone. Yep. They exactly. just stopped or <clears throat> they would uh, not do a high enough loan to value that you didn't have to bring even more money to the table and, and maybe you didn't have that much uh, or you did have that much and you weren't planning on, you know, putting more into the property. So, so things do happen. And one of the benefits of working with a, a private lender, a balance sheet lender is that, um, it's a, there's more flexibility, um, working with a balance sheet lender than there is yep. working with your institutional types. If that was with the bank, you're just out of luck. Yeah. And, and, you know, to further, like before, before COVID and this, you know, pandemic, I mean, there were people doing, you know, 75 closing in on 80% LTV loans on, on fix and flips and, and, and fix to rent. Well, people who refi, you know, the institutions that refinance those loans are only in refi them typically at 80% LTV. So like you're not even leaving yourself any cushion for a market swing or a market change. So, you know, one of the things, you know, people are like, well, can, can I have a higher LTV on this loan and I want to refinance it into a rental? It's like, you don't want one. Like you think you do, but you don't, because if something changes, like we just saw, now you're stuck with the property. Now what do you do? Cause now you have a 75% LTV loan 
and the, you know, and the banks are only refining 70% or 65%. Right. You know, it's, you know, so you don't want to put yourself, you know, it's just some of those things to think about as you're going through all this, you know, it's, you know, it's nice to use, to leverage your money and use someone else's money to do these deals. But you got to also think about market condition changes. Not that you have to take a 50% LTV loan, but you know, Maybe not seventy five if if your exit is eighty percent LTV. Okay, absolutely. Um, and right now is the best time to be levered, as long as you're not over levered because the interest rates are so low. If you can qualify for a Fannie Freddie um, type of investment loan, I mean you're looking at upper threes, lower fours, mm-hmm. for thirty years. Um, you think your rents are going to be going down or up over that period of time? <laughs> well, you were up, 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 up. <laughs> right. So that's a great way to con- control your costs. Um, we did kind of cover the bubble thing at the beginning. Um, I, I there's, I think we're. And by the by the way, I, I guess I could have read the question. Do you feel a bubble is coming? Um, it's a repeat uh, person who, who asked those questions before. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, all of our crystal balls are a little worn out at this moment. <laughs> They're not as accurate as they used to be. Well, and, 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 the, and the, there the is going to be a slowdown. I don't think there's a bubble. And the, the bubble is such a like a, a nebulous kind of term. And people say bubble. Bubbles are very localized. They are, you know. It's, it's not like there's this bubble over the Southeast or there's this bubble over the state of California or, you know, whatever it is, you know, they're, they're very local to very, you know, to local markets. Now, can they, can they reach bigger? Sure. But, you know, you know, let's just say in the Southeast, if there's a bubble in Miami, that's going to look a lot different than Jacksonville in the same state. So, you know, you gotta, you gotta look at each uh, MSA uh, differently. Well, I can tell you this, there are going to be people that have, you know, low 700 scores right now that maybe in six months won't be able to get a loan (laughs) as credit starts to tighten up. I am more concerned about the treasury buying up uh, mortgages than anything else, because right now the only reason we're still making mortgages is because treasury is buying a bunch of them. And why do I say that? It's all about the secondary market. So when a bank or a mortgage company makes a loan, they it's backed by Fannie and Freddie, but it's um, securitized and it's sold on wall street. So when they, and I'm just going to give you an example. Let's say you have a hundred thousand dollar loan and now this loan is now, it's, it's been made, it's being sold to the secondary market and uh, they're going to buy it at 102. Okay. So what does that mean? Well, they're buying it instead of their, instead of them paying a hundred thousand dollars for the loan, they're paying a hundred, uh, yeah, a hundred thousand, I'm sorry, 102,000 for the loan. Mm-hmm. And then why would they do that, Bill? Yeah, well, that, they're assuming that over a four to five year period, and it used to be that the average loan stayed on the books for seven, and that's come down quite a bit since rates have continuously dropped (laughs) Uh, and people move more often now. Um, But it takes them two, two and a half, three years to just recover that $2,000 extra that they paid for that $100,000 loan. And as rates continue to drop, people are refinancing every year, year and a half. So guess what? That money that they paid for that, they've lost money on those loans. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of these secondary markets are saying, you know, I'm not doing this anymore. (laughs) I'm losing money. I'm only going to offer you 98 for it now because I have to make up for my losses. And what would that do to our uh, mortgage market? Well, nobody is going to make a loan to lose money. <laughs> so the treasury has been buying those loans at at least par so they can continue. And par means they, they would pay for pay it 
what it's worth. So they'd buy the hundred thousand dollar loan at a hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. And so they're propping this up right now. And the more rates drop, the bigger the fear of constant refinances are going to be going on. It's not a biggest deal on the purchase side of things, but if you're doing refinances, secondary market doesn't quite like it. And at the same time, you're taking these very new mortgages. Uh, if people uh, have a forbearance on it or ask for some sort of modification uh, during the shutdown, that hurts even worse because now they got to take those loans out of securitization. They have to buy them back, modify them, and then try and sell them again. And then when they sell them back, they're damaged goods. <laughs> they're scratch and dent. So mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of issues coming down the pike that are, are going to have to do with uh, the mortgage business. I don't know exactly how it's going to turn out, but don't worry about it. <laughs> you paint such a beautiful picture, Bill. Because... It's it's opportunity for real estate investors. But yeah, for local real estate investors. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, mm -hmm. it's opportunity. So there, there's mine. <laughs> All right. Um, right now, again, I'll go back to this right now. Housing prices are going up in the affordable market range. And in our area, it's three fifty or less. It's mm -hmm. maybe different for your area. Uh, but if you have a property that's kind of underperforming or one that you've built up a ton of equity in over time, now uh, might be a great time to consider selling it, getting that top dollar and then uh, utilizing that money in another outlet. OK. Um, I, I'm not saying that the sky is falling in. I'm just saying take advantage of what the market is giving you. That's all. Yep. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. All right, folks. Uh, thanks. Hope for, this was helpful. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Uh, if you want information on borrowing money from us, carolinahardmoney.com. Click on the borrower tab if you're interested in investing in our fund or uh, perhaps doing one-off loans as well. Uh, click on the investor tab. Enjoyed it. We have another show coming up at uh, 105 where we're going to interview Dr. Paul White who has a great little uh, investor uh, app and it all runs on the iPhone or Android. Um, I'm old, so I have iPhones. <laughs> Is it iPhones for, for old people now? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Old people and people with money. <laughs> Which are usually just old people. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Anyway, um, everybody have a great day. Um, same time next week or if you're going to join us on our next show. I appreciate it. Have a wonderful awesome. day.